<laughs> we're gonna we're gonna spend the next hour in silence. Uh, <laughs> it'll be refreshing for everybody, I'm sure. Uh, the the uh, my name is Stephen Zecker. I, I'm the head of uh, regional development and project finance at the Milken Institute Israel Center. I also work with uh, the Fellows Program on many initiatives related to the topic this morning. Many of our fellows are here this morning, and I encourage all of you to to uh, to find one and greet them. <laughs> um, this morning we're building on several of the major themes uh, at the Global Conference this year, emerging and developing markets and capital gaps, um, where capital includes financial, social, and technology resources. Uh, the, the order for the day, uh, we're going to take a, a couple of minutes to sort of set the stage and then uh, have some remarks by the panelists and perhaps some discussion, and then uh, I, I want to make sure that we have time uh, to engage you. Uh, many of you were involved in uh, the emerging markets in a variety of ways, um, and uh, we're, we're interested in hearing your thoughts and, and your, your responses. Um, I might add also, this is not a panel about Israel. Um, uh, we, we happen to all be uh, from Israel, uh, but we're, we're, we're using Israel as a laboratory for uh, innovations that, uh, to engage the emerging markets, because we have some experience in that, as you're going to find out this morning. Um, so before I introduce the panel, I'm going to just lay out a couple of things in, in case uh, any of you haven't been paying attention over the last uh, uh, day or so uh, at the conference. Um, if you could go to slide three, please. This illustrates the, the trends that we're all familiar with by now. The growth rates in the emerging markets tracking well above advanced economies, uh, a little bit north of 5.5% uh, for the emerging markets, a little lower than 2% uh, in, in some cases uh, for, the, for the advanced uh, markets projected through 2014. A very, very uh, important trend. Uh, if you move to slide four, um, what this is doing, uh, as we've heard already documented in other presentations here th this week, is that, uh, that this trend has led to virtual parity uh, in 2012 um, between the emerging and, and uh, uh, advanced economies. Um, and in 2013, uh, trading places uh, on, on a purchasing parity basis, um, which is a, a, a startling uh, uh, fact in an $82 trillion uh, dollar economy, world economy. Um, if you move to, to slide five, please, the, 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 that hides a lot of, of, of nuance, uh, a, lot of, a lot of social ills. Uh, the, the, while these, these new markets are robust in the aggregate, um, the prosperity is not felt broadly. Uh, in, in very real and comparative terms on a per capita basis uh, that the, the, the uh, uh, emerging markets are far below uh, by a factor uh, of, of, of advanced economies. And slide 14, if you would. The, the, while there are many efforts by multilateral I'm taking on faith that they're up there, by the way. I, 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 I can't see them. <laughs> if, if, if there are cartoons behind me, please just tell me that, that, that I shouldn't be. Uh, the, the, uh, that there are many m efforts by multilaterals uh, that to support these emerging markets, in, in, indeed, uh, and in quite a, a, a tremendous level. On slide 12, if you go back there, I'm making it bounce around a little bit, uh, that private capital is key. Uh, in terms of uh, infusing growth into those markets. It, uh, private, there's, n there's, n there's no substitute for private investment. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a, uh, a theme uh, at the Milken Institute, uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's clear uh, that, that we need to find ways of, 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 of building on that. Slide 13, um, going back there, the sources of private investment uh, credit uh, the fuel for growth, the, the, the place we look to, the traditional credit markets, uh, is underdeveloped uh, at best in, in the emerging markets. Indeed, on slide 20, <laughs> keep your finger on that button, uh, that formal banking services are very, very weak 
uh, in the emerging markets. So there's really this disconnect uh, in, in the emerging markets between what's, what, what potential there is and, what, and what's possible uh, given the, the current state of, of international uh, credit infrastructure. And slide 21, if you go there, um, the, the various forms of, of foreign direct investment remain strongest in developing economies. And what's interesting is that the, the gaps traditionally, all of us are familiar with, have been made up in large part by uh, social investing, various forms of social investing in the, in the emerging markets. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to explore that theme a little bit uh, later in, in this morning's remarks by our panelists. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to put a slide up. If you go back to slide seven, this is a little bit busy. I don't even know what it looks like up here. It's, no, it's fine. You can let it all go. It's it's uh, it's going. <laughs> this is this is sort of that that uh, that triangle or the pyramid of 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 capital that we're talking about this morning. And there are various tools, various programs, various various approaches. Some of which you'll hear about this morning. Uh, but it's sort of a it's a it's a a list. Uh, of, of, of how the landscape really does play out uh, in terms of what's going on in these markets. You're going to hear about this. So as you'll now hear, each of these forms of capital are necessary, but they're insufficient alone. So working together with among these three forms of capital is critical to the success of, of projects, of scalable and sustainable projects. Now I'll get to the reason why you, you came this morning. The, 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 the panel that we've, that we've assembled here, their experts and their operators in their various areas, are, are going to share their experiences and plans for developing projects and programs in these markets, um, some of which are, are already on the ground, some of which uh, have succeeded broadly, uh, and some of which are still in the planning stages. Um, but but they're, they're all part of this puzzle that we're putting, putting before you in terms of, of building a sustainable structure. So first, um, I want to turn to uh, Eitan Stieb, the founding partner of Vital Capital Fund. The, the bio and background for Eitan is in your package, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to read it. Um, but I'm going to ask Eitan to, to describe a little bit about uh, this pioneering affordable housing construction that he's doing at scale in Africa. Uh, he's achieving important social and market rate business objectives. He's marrying the two uh, at the same time. Um, so Eitan, if you could give, uh, take a few minutes and just describe what you're doing and how you got there and where Thank you're going. Thank you very much. Sure. Good morning. It's an intimate panel, so we can go into more stories storytelling rather than uh, facts and figures. But <coughs> Vital is uh, uh, bridging this gap by providing a platform for Western investors to uh, use, their, use private equity at scale uh, for national priorities in uh, different African countries. So taking that very broad definition uh, into detail, I can describe two or three uh, such cases. Um, spending uh, over 27 years in Africa, in different countries, uh, you come by and you get to know the situation of the population, the dilemmas the government uh, uh, have in front of them, and you try to bring your own experience into those places and, uh, and contribute to solve the problems. For example, in 2002, the war in Angola ended. It was a long 30-year uh, civil war, independence war, then a civil war. And during these 30 years, the population was uh, all moving into the coast, to the capital, living in refugee camps. And immediately when the war ended, uh, the government had a dilemma of how to attract the people to go back and. Uh, settle the developing, the rural areas in the country. So we uh, presented to the government the concept of the Israeli Moshav, which is a supportive uh, type of uh, agricultural settlement. Uh, each farmer gets his uh, piece of land and uh, gets the support from a central agro-industrial logistics center. Um, usually in Africa, a farmer has to 
master all the parts of his business, from financial, uh, veterinarian services, mechanical, marketing, packaging, processing, everything. And uh, not, not all of them are able to do it. So uh, we came up with an idea to provide a center to support local farmers. And, uh, and by that way, they can be limited and uh, work on what they're best in, farming. All the rest is uh, supported by, uh, by this uh, center. The center is a private investment together with the Ministry of Agriculture, and uh, it's very profitable. Supporting a whole region, thousands of farmers. Um, the figures I can mention is that the average income per family was around four to five hundred dollars net a year uh, within six or seven years, each family makes over five thousand, six thousand dollars net a year. It made a complete change in the, uh, in the area, in the region. <coughs> Many people, the economy starts moving, lots of people come in, move in. And uh, one of the biggest obstacles we had on this project is to persuade the government, which was an ex-communist style government, to pass the land ownership to the farmers. So this is, is an issue that we uh, insisted because we wanted the farmers to be committed to their own land, uh, to love it, to be there, to build a family and their future on the land. Um, this is called Aldea Nova. It's in Aldea Nova, the new village concept. We don't call it Moshav, but it's based on the Israeli philosophy, not the kibbutz. Kibbutz is a different problem. <laughs> Another example, just uh, to to bring uh, to put on the table, is the uh, energy sector. We invested in uh, biomass and hydroelectric small power stations, regional power stations. <coughs> the idea is, for example, Mozambique has this huge Caborabasa uh, uh, hydroelectric dam, producing two megawatt of energy, most of it going to South Africa. Now, now the economy is growing in Mozambique. They need more. If the country waits and the people wait for another big two megawatt dam to be built, it will take years. Huge financing requirements, etc. So the, the fastest solution to get things done is just to build a local uh, village level one or two or five megawatt stations in, the, in different areas. Housing is a long story, but I'll let other people talk okay. before me. We'll come back to the housing. <laughs> oh, that's, that's terrific. The, the source of capital uh, for those initiatives, the... the, the, the okay. V vital Capital is a, a private equity fund. We do impact invest... We impact invest in Africa, basically. Um, the source is private uh, equity, uh, institutionals, banks, who found... We set up a platform for Western investors, meaning that we will not deal with corrupt governments or not be exposed to any uh, such type of activities. In the countries we're involved in, uh, we invested in Angola and Congo. In, uh, we're looking at projects. We invested in Ghana. We're looking at projects in Gabon, uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, Mozambique, Djibouti, Tanzania, and more. <laughs> Uh, we'll come back. I have uh, some more questions. We do want to help hear about the housing, uh, the housing uh, project that you're, the projects that you're involved in. Next, I, I want to turn uh, to uh, to Tali Zinger, uh, who's an attorney and a former co-founding, managing director of the Mina Investment Network. Uh, among her many professional activities in the developing world, including the the, uh, the Middle East. Uh, Tally has, has begun to design a platform to jumpstart human capital in the international development market, uh, focusing on igniting interest uh, in the, these frontier markets by talented, enthusiastic young people who are mainstream, who are working in the, in the mainstream markets. Tally, give us some background on your thinking and your plan and where this came from and, and, and uh, some of the dimensions of it. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Steve, uh, for giving me the chance to talk about this platform. And uh, thank you for, for joining us uh, this morning. 
Um, so uh, as Steve said, I work on private sector projects on the legal and business development side, taking innovative technologies into the developing markets. And from my experience, similar to what Steve has mentioned, there are three key elements. There's the finance need and the need for a long-term and very patient capital, which I'm not going to get into and which Eitan can speak very well to. Uh, technology, the need for adapting technology, identifying which technologies we can take from the developed economies or from the more innovative economies that have already established uh, paths of growth for technology and how they can be adapted uh, to local markets in the developing world. And the human capital element meaning the know-how, the eagerness of an individual to have the vision, to apply that vision, and to feel the, the ability to, to bring change uh, based on whether it's adapting technology or a mindset and a different business model. Um, if you can go to slide uh, 24, please. Um, so I, I think it's important just to take a, a quick step back and acknowledge some of the broader trends that make uh, platforms like uh, the one I'm working on to develop human capital uh, important, as well as the other projects we're hearing uh, today. There's, you know, we've experienced a big paradigm shift. Uh, it's not pr probably not news to anybody that, it's, you know, governments no longer have the monopoly on economic development pol policy, whether it's through social protests, uh, Occupy movements, the quote-unquote Arab Spring, uh, we are interconnected nodes that, that connect to one another and seek to address each other's lives and help one another, as well as further our own interests and benefit and, uh, and, and seek profit, regardless of how government pushes us. Um, they can, government can incentivize, government can be a barrier, government certainly provides elements of security and insurance, but it's no longer, they no longer have uh, the monopoly. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. And I think the interesting question here is what does this actually mean for economic development? I think what we see worldwide is a, a sense of an, an increasing intolerance uh, for economic development policies that transfer wealth from the middle classes in wealthy economies to the elites in poor economies. I think that people want to be more involved in how their countries are receiving the economic development assistance, as well as in the way in which they are providing that, that assistance. And I think that's a, a major opportunity, but there are also some real needs. Uh, there's needs for specific skills and knowledge, for training and entrepreneurship, for an ability to look at development, and I don't just mean accessing emerging markets as a business opportunity, but also with a mindset to addressing some of the major human issues within these markets. Um, but there's um, a, a different role for non-state actors, whether it's private sector or academia. And, and all of these are really opportunities for small economies that have limited state budgets, that historically in the, in the old model, in the old paradigm, would have just been riders along on the larger countries' big ticket development assistance, uh, these are real opportunities for these co smaller countries with limited state budgets to actually punch above their weight. Um, it's similar, you know, Steve pulled up slide 12 before, and, you know, we see this. We see the private capital flows taking over the, the larger uh, uh, government-driven development assistance. Um, the, um, you know, uh, in thinking about this, pro this project, um, my partner and I, uh, my partner, Ram Fishman, uh, he was on path to be uh, an engineer and a mathematician. I was in the investment banking world. And both of us independently found ourselves with experiences overseas. And upon coming back from experiences overseas where we could apply skills that we had or just a mindset we had and ask certain questions and get to know the local culture with a bit of background of our own skill set, we found that there was actually, we could make an impact. And when I say make an impact, I don't, I don't know that I bettered anyone's life, but I got this impression that I could, which was enough to give me a drive to continue and to stay at it and to stay in this world of relating to developing markets. Um, the, if you go to slide 26, I think, I think we can start thinking about what, do this, what does this different paradigm mean for the different building blocks of economic development? With regards to technology, um, it's, you know, in, in the old model, we might have taken as part of a, a large USAID finance project, just brought a technology package and just brought it to the developing world and kind of told the local community, this is what you need to be doing. These are the products you need to be buying. These are the products we need to be giving you. In this new model, we're talking about different bottom of the pyramid thinking, how we actually serve the markets of the bottom of the pyramid, how you adapt technology, create new ones, how you work with local communities as opposed to just importing the models we know. Um, Design for development is a very interesting movement that's doing a lot of this. So on the human capital side, it's how do you actually shape this new Peace Corps? 
it's, it's no longer going to be soldiers of people going on to kind of cookie cutter box projects saying here's where you teach people uh, English or here's where you teach people how to wash their hands, but it has to be a full understanding of what's actually happening on the ground. So, um, you know, we started with academia uh, and student engagement, realizing that if you can capture students at the stage of, of their uh, development where they are focused on their careers, whether it's business, law, medicine, agriculture, engineer, and computer science, and give them an incentive to be in a developing economy for a summer or a semester and do serious on-the-ground research in sustainable development, they can start to understand where their mindset can actually bring solutions in the adaptation of technology and approaches to developing markets. Without that on-the-ground experience, a student, especially in a small economy that is not necessarily focused on actually bringing change to developing worlds, but more on survival or just exporting to advanced economies, uh, students otherwise will mostly go about their, their lives and find themselves graduating and continuing, whether it's the private sector or public sector, without a sense that they can actually bring impact. Whereas in that period of students' life, um, we're seeking to, to we're, we're partially there, we're starting a Kickstarter campaign to finance students who will uh, spend their summers or spend uh, term time research integrating what they know from the lab and what they know from their schools on the ground. The idea being that when they come back, they may not be uh, the founders of the next big vital capital, right? They may not found the next uh, youth village and bring the new, uh, the new business model to make that uh, sustainable. But what they may do if they don't pursue that route full time is that they may go on their lives and go work for Intel and go work for a drip irrigation company, but with the mindset that these technologies have use in developing markets and constantly asking themselves those questions. Um, and, and this way we can, we can create that core of, of a different kind of Peace Corps, if you will, a set of students who will then go on to, to be long-term committed to the developing world and to understanding that in addressing developing world issues, it's not enough to just export whatever it is they know or write a check, but actually to use their ingenuity. And this is where, again, small economies, uh, especially Israel, has the entrepreneurship and the ingenuity culture that can be, that can be um, exported, and export is the wrong word here, but that can be brought to some uh, developed markets to be doing uh, thought development together with the local communities. So I, I think it's actually interesting if, you know, we see the students as a basis for this flow. And I think that, you know, it's, it's interesting that for, uh, you know, for, for tens of thousands of dollars, we're not talking about the large, the large scale uh, uh, government assistance programs we usually talk about. For tens of thousands of dollars, you can develop a core of students to be fully engaged. And that's, that, that has fruits over time. There are several, you know, in the education movement in the States, they've seen a lot of fruits of planting seeds with people at the age where they are in the process of being students. Um, and afterwards, that stays with them over the course of their lives, and they can be leaders in development. I think it's interesting if you think about, if you think of a handful of small economies around the world, uh, if they were to all engage in this kind of platform, and you could have a, a network of a core of students or people who were students at some time engaged in development activity on the ground, um, I think the potential is, is tremendous. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. It's, it's, uh, it is, it's very exciting. It's, uh, it sort of reminded me a little bit of our uh, fellows program in terms of uh, putting, putting, putting them in government service uh, for, uh, for a short period of time so that they, they take, uh, they take that, uh, that back with them wherever they go, and they'll always have that. Uh, but it's, 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 it's interesting. The, uh, the thread that, you, that, you're, that you're describing is important, actually, for everybody at this table in terms of they, they all have a personal, we all have a personal story that actually brings us back to do what we do. Uh, and, 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 and you can manage that, that story. It's, 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 a, it's a terrific idea. I'm curious to hear some reactions as we, as we, as we go forward. But, but first, I, 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 and, and to build on the, that whole issue of personal uh, stories and personal commitment, which is really what we're talking about, I want to turn to Ann Heyman, the uh, philanthropist and founder of the Agahazo Shalom Youth Village in Rwanda. Um, a, a, a clearly unique and an interesting and a, and a, and a personal story. It's, it's really building on, on Tali's uh, point and combines a personal and professional commitment to broader to this new uh, and, and ins inspiring place. And if you could share with us uh, in, the spirit, in, in, in the spirit of what Tali described, your story uh, and, and how you ended up, uh, the path that you took to get where you are now and what you're doing now um, uh, using Israeli social innovation and technologies. Please. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to just throw up slide 29. 
Um, and I'll give you some slides in the background as I talk just to make it a little more interesting. Um, but my personal story, you know, I, I think my personal story starts really in 1994. When I, you know, when I think about where was I in April 1994, which is when the Rwandan genocide took place, I was home with my two young children and pregnant with my third, and I actually don't have a recollection of ever thinking about Rwanda. I have since looked back at New York Times articles from that time, and they were there, but it never touched my life. Fast forward to 2005. Um, I'm at a lecture at Tufts University with a speaker talking about the Rwandan genocide and making conversation with him. Um, my husband says, what's the biggest problem facing Rwanda today? And he says, in a country where you have 1.2 million orphans in a population of 8.5 million people with no systemic solution to dealing with the orphan problem, there is no future for that country. I will tell you that today Rwanda has a population of 12 million people, which is a problem in and of itself to be addressed in another forum. Um, but there are 2.85 million orphans and vulnerable children. And unless you deal with that problem of orphans and vulnerable children, they will be our problem in the future, whether it's through refugees, through conflict, through if we do not reabsorb those kids into society, it will be a problem for all of us. And when I heard that statement, it actually literally popped into my head that there is a systemic solution for the orphan problem. In Israel, after the Second World War, there were thousands of orphans. They built youth villages. Those kids were reintegrated into Israeli society. And there is no orphan problem to speak of in Israel today. And immediately, the, the words actually popped out of my mouth at that table, you should build youth villages. And the response around the table was, that's a great idea. Could you pass the salt, please? And that was the end of the conversation. Um, but it was something I couldn't let go of. And I didn't particularly know a lot about youth villages. I'd grown up in a Zionist youth movement. I knew they existed. Um, but I started to do research. And um, through my research, I got connected with Chaim Perry, who runs a youth village in Israel. Some of you may have heard of Yamin Ord. And I went, uh, Chaim invited me to come to Israel and present my idea about a, an African youth village to a number of people at Yemi Nord. And actually the day before I went up to Yemi Nord, my daughter who was then 13 was in Israel on her eighth grade trip. And she came to visit me at my hotel. And I was walking around saying, I've got this big presentation, 30 people were coming to meet with me. And I knew I wanted to, I had this big vision for these, uh, you know, Shalom youth villages all over Africa. Um, with the name of the country, a word in whatever the language was that was appropriate. And at this time in my life, I did not know one Rwandan other than the one that I had met that night at Tufts. Um, and I certainly didn't know any Kenya Rwanda. So my daughter said, give me a few minutes, flipped open her computer. Within five minutes, she said, I have a name for you, Agahoso, a place where tears are dried. So that became the name of the presentation the next day, the Agahoso Shalom Youth Village. Went to Yamin Ord. Um, the conversation began with where is Rwanda and why should we care? And since I had spent the last six months reading about Rwanda, I had lots of good answers for that. And the conversation ended with, well, wh why don't you know anybody in Rwanda and when can we go? Um, and we got up from their table and I literally turned to my friend who was at this time my team was me and a friend of mine named Tina. And I said, we have to be in Rwanda on the ground three, three weeks. And we literally wrote to people all over the world. Canada, Belgium, anywhere, said, who do you know in Rwanda? Can we have their phone number, their email? We're coming. And um, I also realized that I needed someone who at least spoke in Rwanda. So when I came back to, to the States, I said about to hire a Rwandan who was living in the States as an ex executive director, someone who could work with me. And so the three of us, we immediately did a quick trip to Rwanda, discovering that it was a model that would work there, that culturally that they wanted it, that they needed it. And in fact, people were saying, when can you come? Let's get started. Um, but we really went about things in what I consider the right way. Um, I went with my Rwandan, my new Rwandan best friend and Tina to Rwanda that summer. We took a group of Ethiopian Israelis with us who had grown up in the youth village system. Um, and we did a, you know, a dog and pony show. We went to all the, not only the NGOs, but also the ministries that deal with orphans and explained what this was and how we would go about doing it. Um, and again, everybody was pushing us to come, but we, decided that we were going to create an advisory group, take them to Israel, let them look at the model, 
um, make the adjustments that needed to be made, bring it back to Rwanda. And so from September 2006 till January 2007, I was in Israel for 10 days, home for 10 days, Rwanda for 10 days, home for 10 days. Um, and during that time, we created a Rwandan model. Um, it very much, philosophy and methodology is exactly the same as the Israeli model, but the way that the kids live, the, um, the setup is a little bit different. And uh, we hired, we found land in Rwanda, which we purchased. We did not let the government um, expropriate it for us. And we um, hired Rwandan architects, Rwandan builders, and we have done everything locally. Today, we actually st we launched the project in September of 2006. We moved our first 125 kids in in December of 2008. Um, our Rwandan partners thought we were crazy. My, can you imagine the architect's face when I said, I, you know, we're great. I met him in uh, fall of 2006. I said, we're breaking ground 2007. We're moving in our first kids 2008, and here's what I need. A village for 500 kids, which includes a high school, state-of-the-art high school with enough classrooms for 500 kids. Um, 32 children's houses, the kids live 16 kids in a house with uh, a mom and they have a big brother or big sister who's a, a college educated Rwandan. Um, and uh, you know, step by step, we did it. We continued building over the last four years. We graduated our first class this year, uh, January 2013. Um, they took the national examinations, which is like the Bagrut exam in Israel in February. Uh, we had 118 kids sit for the exam, 117 of them passed the exam, and the one who didn't came to us not being able to read and write in any language. And she can do that both in English and in Kenya Rwanda now. Um, our educational methodology, we work with teachers from Branko Weiss in Israel. Uh, for our formal education methodology, we actually have had a pedagogical advisor living in the village for the last year, and this year she's coming in and out three times to continue the education process. Our, our educators come in and work with our teachers. You know, the, the, any advisors that we have come in, whether it's working with our teachers or working with our management staff, we do a lot of management training. Um, we, our, one of our founding partners is a company called LiquidNet, and in the interest of full disclosure, my husband is the uh, head of LiquidNet and sitting at the table. <laughs> um, but LiquidNet provided for us um, not only some seed capital, but most importantly, what you were talking about, which is the human capital. We had, and we still have, people coming over, and it's not, you know, one of the things that I've learned is that you can't do a one-off. You can't send a person to a training for three weeks. No matter how much they take it in and come back, they go back into their old environment, they cannot implement what they have learned. It is too difficult. But when you're able to have a team come in once a year, twice a year, three times a year, and reinforce and continue, and also have that relationship so you can pick up the phone, you can send an email, our village is wireless, thanks to LiquidNet. Um, it, it's, it enables you to build and sustain and grow. And I will tell you that today we have 130 employees on the ground in Rwanda. Not one of them is an expat. They manage that village in an extraordinary way. Um, you know, they come in under budget every month. Um, and it is, uh, the kids' success, you know, it's, our kids have not, because they've just graduated, they haven't applied to Western universities yet, although um, a few of them made the Canada deadlines and so applied to Canada. We have four kids going full-ride scholarships to McGill University. This is a system that works. And not only that, but these are kids who, because of the way the, the Youth Village philosophy and methodology works, they are committed to giving back to their community. They are giving, committed to building their country. Um, and, uh, you know, just... As a side, when you look at the people who came out of the youth villages in Israel, this generation of leaders, it's the Yitzhak Rabins, the Shimon Peres, these are, this is the quality and the caliber of kids, and I kid you not, you have to come and meet them. They are extraordinary. This is the way that we are going to affect fundamental change in Rwanda. And they already are. You know, the, part of the village philosophy is the Tikkun Olam program. The kids have to go out into the community every week um, and do their service. So for them, their service is building houses for people who don't have houses. We live in a subsistence farming area. If you can't grow food, you can't eat. They grow food for people who can't eat. They teach English. They teach computers. We have com a com computer center in the village. We welcome the kids from the neighboring schools that don't have computers, and our kids teach them. So this, then they go back to their home communities, and they've all implemented programs in their home communities. So even before they graduate and leave us, they are affecting incredible change. And actually, there's a whole delegation here from from, from Wonder if you run into any of them, you should talk to them, and they will tell you about how incredibly extraordinary this project is. 
Now we come to the bottom line problem, which is, and how do you sustain it? So I always talk about two types of sustainability. One is what I just talked about, which is that we now have 130 Rwandans. They're running it. They know how to do it. They have resources to turn to if they need assistance. But I am not worried that if I don't ever show up at work again tomorrow, they don't need me. They can do it. But how do you finance it? And that is the biggest problem. When I'm not in Rwanda, I am spending my life running around the country, talking to people, trying to raise money to finance it. It is not a sustainable method of uh, you know, sustaining this village. But also, this is a village that you know, we have now proven that you can take an existing um, project in Israel and bring it to a foreign market. And with some adaptation, it is completely scalable. And so the orphan problem in Rwanda is only indicative of that in sub-Saharan Africa. There are 100 million orphans in our world, and we can actually do something about it. But again, how do you finance it? So being in the developing world, recognizing that now we have kids who are being taught how to think, how to uh, be strategic, how to problem solve. These kids are a tremendous resource for any business. Anyone that's done any work in the developing world will tell you the problems of management, biggest problem that exists. Um, and these are the kids that understand it and, and already understand about how to plan and how to deal with things that come up. And so how do you use these kids um, in a way that benefits them, benefits the village? And the answer is to bring, for us as a village, to partner with businesses and to partner in ways that make sense for the country. So what are the areas that are areas of development in the country? ITC, computers. Our kids are all computer literate, and we have many programs where they learn to take them apart, put them together, to program, to do all different aspects of computer life. Um, modern agriculture. Rwanda is still a subsistence farming country, but it, the yields are terrible. The methodologies are terrible. The kids are learning modern agricultural methods. We should be partnering with an agribusiness that wants to come in and utilize these kids, the land that we have, because we purchased the land and did not have the government um, expropriated for us, we wound up with 144 acres of land. So we have a nice size farm that we can really use as a model farm, plus all of our neighbors are subsistence farmers. If we come up with something good, there's no doubt they will be joining. Um, and the third area that we've looked at, and actually the first one that we're launching, is solar energy. Rwanda, as many of these other uh, areas suffer from a tremendous lack of energy to fuel their economy. And um, we have partnered with an Israeli solar company. Uh, they will, uh, you know, and part of the advantage of coming in as we did with a social program that was really beneficial to everybody is that we have a lot of great friends in Rwanda. Um, and so we were able to smooth the way for the partnership for the Israeli solar company. Um, we acted as their broker, their partner. They are, uh, we're about to sign a PPA with the government. Um, and we are going to build the solar field at the village so the kids will be in a training program with respect to solar energy. We will get income from the solar plant, and hopefully the, those, the investors in the solar company will make a lot of money. Um, I'll leave it at that. That's terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That's a no. Can I just add uh, one point about the starting point of these kids? The, this is something we don't understand in the Western world. They do not know that they deserve to receive education, health, and food. They think they have to fight for it. So this is the first stage. It's really you deserve to receive it. You don't have to fight for it or work for it or anything else. But not only that, because they recognize what a gift they've been given, they are committed to learning in a way that you can't even imagine. You know, they have a thirst, and they show up for school early every day, and they just want to go out there, and they want to do good for themselves, for their country. They also appreciate that they would, for our kids anyway, they're all orphans, so they were really, many of them taken off the street, and they understand what it means to not have had a family, and, and now they do have one, and not have had a community, and now they have one. And they are determined to make sure that that doesn't happen to anybody else and to give back to their community. That's, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I, find, I find that uh, the, the word inspiring uh, is, uh, is uh, perhaps not, uh, not adequate <laughs> uh, to describe actually what's being done here um, and the contributions that you're making uh, to that country. Um, and, and I'm sorry, if you just want to slide through the slides while you talk, then they, it's just to really show you a, a quick view. Some of the, so some of the, some of the, uh, the characters that are involved. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it, it's really a, 
it's gratifying and it's and, it, and it's exciting and and I, I feel like uh, almost uh, asking you about returns on investment and uh, and capital structure are are, are almost incidental. Um, <laughs> however, that is what makes the world go round in <laughs> in, in terms of being able to go on and go to a scalable level. So we'll get back to that in a second. Um, and. But I, but I truly uh, extend appreciation for, for what, you, what you've brought to the table this morning. Um, I want to now re uh, turn to uh, Nathaniel Oded, who's a senior economist uh, at the National Economic Council in the Prime Minister's office in, in Israel. And uh, with, with all that you've heard, uh, using uh, very tangible, very concrete, very real uh, examples of, of Israeli social innovation, uh, in some cases Israeli technology, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, still lacking uh, financial innovation, that's what's to come. Um, the, 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 the international markets clearly have, have been key to, to growth for Israel. Uh, and as I said before, most small countries uh, with limited domestic consumption, we've got to we've got to export. We've got to be involved in the international in the international marketplace uh, beyond Europe uh, and beyond uh, the U.S. and Africa and Asia are obvious uh, choices. Uh, already, as you've heard, uh, Etan's already there, uh, making money, uh, doing projects, being successful. Um, Nathaniel, as, as the government is looking for new and innovative approaches to stimulate growth in the emerging markets, I, I ask you can, you, can you comment on the right formula that, uh, maybe not the right formula, the, perhaps the guidelines or directions that the government is, is, is beginning to consider um, uh, action to help build these platforms, sustainable platforms? Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I want to say I, I feel somewhat of the paradigm shift that Tali referred to earlier regarding the decreasing role of government. I think this panel was an amazing showcase of what uh, entrepreneurs can do and what difference they make. And I really feel that sometimes the government should just <clears throat> not disturb them at their work and, and let them do what they do because they're all... They're all You're not going to get off that easily. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think, um, again, governments always try of th and think the, the ways of, of really what they do, what to do, and what, what can they help, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I think uh, regarding emerging, emerging markets, I think, um, first of all, I think the Israeli government really understands that this is not anymore some philanthropic need or something that needs to be done because other, because the international community thinks it's right, but because it's really an, an economic necessity and uh, it's something that needs to be done. And I think that even though we heard amazing uh, stories of Israeli entrepreneurs in these markets, all in all, there's been very little uh, Israeli activity in terms of Israeli um, innovation and technologies within those markets. There's been some, but we feel that it's far short um, from enough. And I think uh, there's several implications for that. I think, first of all, the Israeli economy is losing quite a lot from being focused um, on very certain high-tech sectors and being very focused on Western markets, being the U.S. or Western Europe as those markets are experiencing relative li relatively little growth. And secondly, I think um, also the emerging markets are missing out a bit um, because there is a lot of value in, um, in the type of innovation and the technologies that, that exist and the specific know-how that exists in Israel. And I think there's great value to deploy that kind of technology and, and know-how within emerging markets, being Africa, being Asia, and all over the world. Um, so I think there are several reasons why Israeli firms have been relatively less successful in emerging markets. And I think it's the inherent properties of Israeli um, technology firms. First of all, they're very small, most of them. And when you're small, it's very hard to succeed. Um, in emerging markets with where there's much less infrastructure and much less assistance and you need to be able uh, to finance your way several years until you get return on your investment. I think that's the first problem. The second problem um, is that the, the sort of the Israeli DNA has been for, for the past 
several decades to work on the most cutting edge technologies and look less at the price at, and at the social innovation to, to make the technology accessible, but to be, to be able to create the best, most advanced technologies. And I think that's a property that is more suited for Western markets and less for emerging markets. And the third thing is something that also I think Tali, Tali referred to is, 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 the, is, is the people. I think the Israeli innovator, and obviously these are very strong exceptions, but I think your standard Israeli entrepreneur or innovator uh, thinks about Western needs, thinks, of, thinks about Western markets, knows Western partners, and does not have the access that is needed to get to, to these markets, does not think uh, of what he can do to help people's lives in, the, in those countries. Um, and I think if we as a government can have a role in, in, uh, in the activity in those markets, it'll be bridge, bridging those, those gaps. Uh, and there's been several um, initiatives trying to help on those problems. Um, we've been trying to, to find specific areas, specific sectors, specific clusters uh, that are relevant to emerging markets or into the sustain sustainability <coughs> challenges of the world. Try to th think of how to create an ecosystem within Israel uh, to help uh, grow, com grow companies in that area um, and have them, even though they're small, have, have them as a cluster focused on, on a certain area and we feel that can be some sort of solution uh, to the size problem. We've done that uh, with oil alternatives. We're, we're doing it now with uh, agrotech uh, solutions. And basically, we're trying to diversify Israel, not only being in the very specific uh, information and communication technologies, but thinking of how to bring the tech into the agrotech, into clean tech, into energy tech, et cetera, uh, being something that is more relevant for, for a larger set of, of markets. Um, on the finance side, we're, we're, we're doing, I think, two very significant uh, moves in the finance side. First, the first one is an R&D. Uh, basically, the R&D subsidies program in Israel has always focused only on cutting-edge technologies, and I think in the, in the near budget, we're thinking of how, how to help finance more uh, R&D initiatives that don't work at cutting edge, but work in adapting technologies to different markets and translating technologies to different needs and different solutions. Uh, so that's on the R&D side. I think we're also doing very uh, exciting work regarding export risk finance with, uh, together with some of the Milken fellows that are here. Uh, and we're, we're thinking of how to improve um, the export risk insurance that we give to, to Israeli firms and entrepreneurs who work in, in countries that have very severe uh, risk problems. Um, and I think the third thing is, uh, is trying to create platforms uh, to enhance the movement of people, ideas, and technologies between Israel and other sectors. I think until most of Israeli entrepreneurs and innovators know about the needs that are in these markets, we won't see a large set of activities within them. And I think that's probably the most important thing going long term, seeing how more and more people know about the, pr the markets, know of the needs, have matchmaking facilities that enable them to find partners and, and, and find areas and find opportunities for them uh, to succeed. So there's a lot of work being done, but I think the thinking process is underway. One thing that, uh, that we've observed is the lack of, of access that Israeli companies have to multilateral uh, uh, financial institutions, uh, whether it's the World Bank or USAID, uh, in terms of, of taking pro doing projects, large-scale projects, in the emerging markets. And, and one of the gaps that one of the, one of the opportunities to innovate would be to actually create uh, that kind of a financing vehicle. Uh, geared to Israeli companies that are ready to scale into, into the emerging markets. So it's, it's, it's one of the things we've begun to look at and working with. with yeah, that could, be, that could be a fascinating idea. I think, we've, we've, I think there's been a lot of thinking of how to help Israeli firms access those big multilateral international platforms. And there, again, there are several problems. Obviously, there's the awareness problem. And I think that's people are beginning to be more aware. But, I th but again, I think the size and experience are crucial issues, and it, it's it's Sorry. it's something that that needs to be solved first in order to them to gain access to those kind of platforms. Great, great. Can I can I comment on that? Please. 
Um, I heard what Oded says, and I thought I think we can uh, attract Israeli young people to Africa, <coughs> approaching their adventurous nature. They love adventures. They travel, always travel to India, Latin America. Recently, it, Africa has become a, a target for the brave ones of them, the brave ones. <coughs> so we believe that. Uh, Exposure is one of the main issues. It's not a matter of uh, interest. They'll find the subjects. There's a lot to do. Africa is uh, uh, leapfrogging technology, everything. Uh, you you look at the statistics of telecom. There are no nearly no uh, fixed lines. Everyone has a cellular too. Um, internet access is available nearly everywhere. So uh, wh what we are doing in addition to, um, to help expose Africa to Israeli uh, students, as uh, Tali mentioned, we have two programs. One is the African Cent uh, Center for African Studies in Ben-Gurion University. It's an interdisciplinary um, division in the university. Um, part of this program is a three-month voluntary work in Africa. A similar program for a master degree in Jerusalem University. It's called Glocal. It's a new program, just two two years on the road. Um, again, four months of voluntary work is part of the program of the second degree, and that's with the objective to expose Israelis to African opportunities. Opportunities are incredible uh, and very attractive. Um, what else? We we are in every one of our projects. If it's an urban project or or a rural project, agriculture, we create a community center. Uh, we train the trainers, so the the instructors in those community centers are uh, local people, um, including computer science, libraries, um, local arts. So we bring in a local people to teach their local culture, the local art, painting, uh, ceramics, uh, uh, dancing, music. Um, each such artist, we don't uh, pay him to come, we uh, support his uh, artistic activities to produce a disc or a show or a painting or sculpture and in return they have to come to the community center and teach um, the local kids, the street kids who come in, women who come in the morning, uh, about their own culture. Um, and these are things that can be done at nearly zero cost. There's not a not a high cost to that. Great, Eitan. Uh, let me let me interrupt you. Just the the uh, one of the one of the things that I'm hearing a, a common theme is is the development of of social capital, not only not only uh, by the Israeli company that's going in, but also at the local capacity, the, the kinds of experiences that you've had in Rwanda and Angola, the, the, of building actually the community institutions that are, that are sustainable and capable of supporting and accepting and, and, and actually leveraging the, 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 uh, the investment. I want to open it up in the last couple of minutes if, if anybody has a question. Yeah, I was wondering uh, what kind of, um, it sounds t terrific, I, I got to say to you, the work that is being done. Uh, what about, uh, uh, what projects that do, you, do you have in Latin America and in what, what countries, if any? I can speak to one in Nepal. Uh, we have a similar, I know we talked a lot about Africa, so uh, you know, Latin America is, you know, far from, uh, from the Middle East, although plenty of people do travel around there, and I think that um, there's an interesting model. It was interesting for me to hear Natanel speak about the importance of the experience of uh, young students and young people who see their careers in different fields overseas. There's an organization called Tevel Betzedek, which takes uh, Israelis and uh, actually folks from all around the world, but the, at least 50% of the participants at any given point are Israelis that are traveling in Nepal uh, for a year. And it takes four months out of their time, and sometimes there's a shorter program as well. And they're actually really embedded in the community. And they come and they, they learn Nepali. They spend a month uh, framing their approach by learning Nepali. 
Um, they spend a lot of time with local community, and then they work with the local community to figure out what projects make sense. They have a model organic farm. They have a lot of community women's and children's groups. And actually, to Eitan's point, they actually have local community members joining them in this process. And some of the projects they've built, they've already handed off to local Nepalis to run. Um, interestingly enough, after two years of running that program, alumni from that Nepali program, um, Israelis, not Nepalis, went and joined a, a program in Haiti uh, to take that same model and bring it there uh, after the earthquake. And so there is more and more uh, evolution of these programs. It's not happening on the large scale, uh, you know, and really to Netanel's point, it hasn't yet it hasn't yet caught fire as the next place that young people should be looking where they can make an impact. So Latin America is a very interesting area because there are a lot of people that are traveling there now. Um, and plenty of companies would be interested in that market if they had somebody who could take them there or had understanding of that market. Right. There are examples of Israeli companies that are involved in biomass and, yeah. and, and biofuels yeah. that are actually making substantial investments with the help of international funders. I'm going to ask uh, Andrew Taylor, welcome him to the, to, the, to the group here this morning. Andrew uh, has actually gotten his feet wet in Israel, uh, represents uh, the government of Canada uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a, uh, for partners to the north in terms of building platforms, sustainable platforms for development. Andrew, yeah, it's, uh, I work with uh, Grand Challenges Canada. We've been talking with uh, the Israeli government government around uh, developing a similar Grand Challenges Israel. And the idea, and I just want to come back to, and I think from our perspective, um, I think the international community is making this a lot more complicated than it actually needs to be. And what we're trying to achieve is that we're building a pipeline, and we have about 300 innovations um, in our pipeline from innovators in low-middle-income countries, but also in Canada. And start it off really simple. Say, what are your ideas? Because the ideas, and you guys have obviously illustrated that, the ideas are out there. But how do you provide them with a little bit of capital? So we give them $100,000 for 12 to 18 months. Take your idea from the idea to the proof of concept. And then let the market take over in the sense of, um, you're ready to take it to scale. And then what is the role of government public money to really catalyze that? So we're trying to get into the point of bringing in the private sector. But how do you do that? So with matching deals, doing different models. And just to the point, and you guys are going to echo this probably, is that um, the funding community and, and more the governments, we have to do a better job. It's too complicated. Focus right down on the actual social enterprise and figure out a way, and there's not going to be one... Uh, one way to do it with every single in innovator, but I think funders actually have to start innovating on their own to actually figure out what are the right ways to provide it. Is it grant? Is it debt? Is it equity? And I would just flip it around by just saying um, the Israel community has a lot to teach the uh, broader community. So I think I just hope that's where Canada and Israel can come together. But I just want to get to, I'm seeing a lot of nodding of the heads. Is, am I just out to lunch in the fact of you have to really focus down on the actual enterprise and to work with them and to uh, nourish them to move forward? So, you know, I think it, it, it depends on what you're talking about, but certainly from my perspective, um, the notion that there is a tremendous need for this model that works. And I didn't invent the model. I adapted it, but it can be adapted in any country. And certainly, we can start with Sub-Saharan Africa, but a th there are many countries, Asia, many places that need this model. Um, for the Israeli government to provide seed money, um, you know, and, and I think it's not just the Israeli government. I think the government of the country where you're going into as well needs to also participate in that seed money. Um, it's very difficult when you're going into a world and you're talking about a concept that people cannot conceptualize. So, so this is what, when we're talking about um, cultural differences. That, that's what I think of as cultural differences. When I say something and you understand the words coming out of my mouth, but you cannot conceive of what I'm talking about. So when I go to Rwanda and I start talking about a youth village, th there's no way of conceiving what I, I had to build one to show everybody what we're talking about. Now that it's built, I should be able to get government money, um, and and a, a, but that's a bridge. You know, to me, the government funding is a bridge, and it should be a combination of government and philanthropy. There is still a role for philanthropy in the world in which we live today. Um, but that government money, philanthropy money, should be a bridge to what allows 
you know, and, and, what, and sort of justifies it for the Israeli government is that this becomes the platform for launching those businesses. I can now walk into President Kagame's office and he trusts what I say because I did what I said I would. The project does what it says it would. Um, I think that we are, you know, we can talk for, uh, you know, it's an, for another time and place about the, um, the, the Hasbara, the, 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 the goodwill that comes out of this in terms of this kind of project. But it is also from a purely selfish perspective, it is a great launching platform. There was a, uh, excuse me, there was a question back. Another yeah. question, just a, a remark. A lot of these projects are being done through the International Cooperation Agency of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But I think that the shift of paradigm that we're talking about is also seeing it not as a helping out developing countries and not teaching them, but seeing them as emerging markets. So understanding that even within our ministry, because those projects exist in, everywhere in the world. And, and you mentioned South Africa, Central America, everywhere. All right. We're going to wrap it up. I think we're at the end of our time. Uh, appreciate your participation.